Bird Note presents. From Bird Note, this is season two of Bring Birds Back. I'm Tadaja Hamilton. It's springtime here in Atlanta, and my life is a 24-7 chirp fest. Big birds, small birds, gray birds, brown birds, ground birds, sky birds, catching a meal on the wing and eating flies birds. They all like to chit-chat at about 5.30 a.m. The best I can do to get back to sleep is just throw a pillow over my head. But honestly, I kind of love just laying there and listening and appreciating. Their songs are delightful, of course. But there's another thing. These birds are in the fight of their lives. We can take for granted that they'll always be around. I mean, you may remember this statistic from last season. In 2019, a landmark study was published in the journal Science, finding that we've lost almost 30% of all North American birds in the past 50 years alone. That is three billion birds, billion with a B, in only one generation. I can't help but think about my chatty Carolina wrens and robins and their early morning songs like a defiant act of resistance. A literal wake-up call saying, we're still here. And it reminds me of just how much I want to make sure I'm doing my part so that they stay here. That means I've spent a lot more time outside. Sometimes I see some really cool birds in these gorgeous locations like nature preserves and marshes. Like recently, I lost all ability to be cool at my first sighting of a bald eagle. Or a couple of weeks ago, I took my mom to a new park in Atlanta. You remember my mom. She uh, very spiritedly let y'all know that I didn't spend too much time in nature back in season one. If it was summer, you didn't like the heat. If it was winter, you didn't like the cold. You definitely didn't like the bugs. And more than anything else, you didn't like squirrels. I wanted to show her how much I've grown and to share all the stuff I've learned about birds. But when we got to the park, we saw, we found a waterfall. But not a lot of birds. Nothing. Not a zilch. Where are the ducks? They need to give us some love and come closer. Yep. Nature will humble you like that. There's more ground birds hopping around in my house than you see here. At first, I was feeling kind of defeated. A little embarrassed. I mean, I wanted to show off to my mom. And this was definitely not that. But as we continue to explore the park, did somebody carve Donda into that tree? Is that what that says? It felt like nature was reminding me of lesson number one. Birding is supposed to be fun. Even when you can't find a bird you're excited about, you can take joy in being outside, finding the marvelous and the mundane. Oh, you can take such a deep breath out here with the greenage, the air feels fresh going down. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And as I began to take this to heart, we had a little change in our luck. Oh, there's something. Yep. He what just was flew he? right in front of us over the water into a little tree, gray with um, a white band around the wing. You've got all of that just from him flying past us? That means you have definitely been a lot more observant of birds. First off, that was a northern mockingbird. And second, she's right. The joy of birding has absolutely made me more observant. And that's what I try to share with my family and my friends. I encourage them to stop and invite them to become fully present in their surroundings. And I ask, what do you hear? What do you see? Oh, there's one. Oh, he's tiny. Little itty bitty. And that feeling, that feeling there, that's how I get him. And he's just hanging around, just flitting in front of us on this tree. This season, I'm trying to find my people, find community outside. Of course, I'll be finding more ways we can all help our feathered friends. And I'm also trying to become a better.
better birder. I have learned so much about birds and birding in the past two years, and now I'd really love to apply some of that in the field. But here's the incredible part of what I've already learned. The field is anywhere I want it to be. From my windowsill, birding. On a trek through some woods, also birding. Looking out from the passenger seat on the way to the grocery store, yep, still birding. If you like birding, you're a birder. And if you're consistently learning and trying, then guess what? You're on your way to being a better birder. But it's more than just that. It's also about being a more thoughtful and ethical birder. Learning to protect and preserve nature and to be kind to the birders around me. How can I lessen the possibility that I disturb the birds? How can I ensure that I'm doing what I can to make these spaces more accessible in every sense of the word? I want to start the season learning from someone who could help me level up and add to my personal birding toolkit. Specifically, being able to connect birds to a place. Who's going to be in a spot and why? So today we have a very special guest from the home team. We have Connor Guerin, and he is the managing producer of Bird Note Daily. Hi, Connor. Hi, Tanaja. It's great to be here. Tell us a little bit about what you're going to be talking about today and what we're going to do. Yeah, so I'm calling this Crash Course on Birds, and the theme here is connecting birds to a place. There were specific reasons why you see a certain bird species in a particular place. and that really helped me, I think, move beyond just, well, this was the list of species I saw. Like, for me, that's not enough. I want to know more about, like, their homes and how they live and all this stuff. What I really like about that is I think it's reflective of a little bit of where I am with my journey as well. Like, I'm I'm to the point where I see the birds and, you know, I'm kind of learning about them, but it doesn't quite feel connected yet. Absolutely. I think it is a common experience. You sort of learn the cast of characters, in a sense, your typical neighborhood birds, but you don't know the whys, like why these species and what other species might I expect to see in the places I normally go to and just having the reasons behind all these things. All right. So where should I start for all of this? How do we connect the dots on these birds? Okay. So when you're IDing a bird, I think you actually have to start with where am I? Rather than anything else to do with what the bird sounds like or looks like, where are you? So on the largest scale, you have the region. So for both of us, that's the eastern U.S. Zoom in and you start to get landscapes. This is like a bird's eye view of a few square miles. For me, that's a pretty urban landscape with forests on the edges. So like some birds might need to be a few hundred yards from water or to be at least a certain distance away from a built up urban area and then zooming all the way in to get to habitats that are really specific, like the wooded edge of someone's backyard or a wetland behind a Walmart. At each of these levels, birds are drawn to habitats for specific resources. They are where they are for a reason. Usually, and especially in winter, that's for food resources. And if you can figure out what a given habitat can offer birds, that can get you a lot of the way to solving what bird you're seeing. Yeah, because it seems like you're, you're pulling from a smaller data set essentially. Like, instead of thinking about the very wide world of birds, you're already kind of culling it down to keep in mind the 20 or 30 species that you know is in the area. Exactly. So in a sense, you're trying to build a version of the Merlin Bird ID app and the questions that it asks in your head. Where are you seeing this bird? What's it doing? How big is it? What colors do you notice? And all of those questions help with kind of process of elimination. And that can help you know what's probable, but then you also get to know what's weird. So if you see something that's not on that kind of short list of expected birds, then you're like, oh, that's interesting. So do you learn this just by memorizing, you know, robins equal fields near trees? Or how are you tying the birds to these places? So that's a great question. As far as memorizing, it's less that you need to learn the habitat and more about being aware of the birds' diets and behaviors. When you start learning what these birds are actually looking for, it can help you do a couple of things. One, it can help you predict whether they're going to be where you are. Two, it can tell you actually where to look. So if you know that a bird is a ground gleaner, you're going to be looking on the ground. If it's a foliage gleaner, you're looking in the shrubs and, you know, it's probably picking through leaves. 
lots of warblers do that. They're foliage gleaners. Real quick, uh, what do you mean by gleaning? Right. So gleaning refers to how these birds feed. They're looking for different food items in a certain habitat. Let's use the example of a robin picking through the grass. So they're ignoring the grass and they're looking for insects to eat and worms. So they're gleaning. They're ignoring some of the stuff, but they're picking out certain food items. Okay, so I feel like I've got the basics here. But what if I want to check my work? What's the best way to see if a bird sighting makes sense? This brings up something that I wanted to talk about, which is using eBird with a purpose. eBird is not just useful for keeping track of the birds you've seen. You can use it to find out what other people are seeing. So we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, Connor's got a little game for me to test and sharpen my skills. Be right back, y'all. This is Bring Birds Back. I'm Tanajay Hamilton. And Connor is helping me learn how to get better at identifying some of the birds around me. So, Connor, you have a little game for me today. You've picked some of these everyday habitats I might find myself in, and I'm going to guess what birds I might find there, right? Exactly. So I have a few different locations that you might pass through in your daily life. All right, so the first one... A wetland in a city, reeds and cattails, very dense, not a lot of open water. So what are some birds you might have seen in a place like this? Oh, help me out here, Connor. (laughs) Okay, so you might see birds like a red-winged blackbird. These are birds that love marshes. They do nest there, so that's why there tends to be quite a lot of them. You might also see a spotted sandpiper. This is a shorebird, and shorebird's kind of a misnomer here. They can actually show up in just little puddles along the side of a street. And they might seem pretty different, but what these birds have in common is they're looking for certain food resources that they can find in a marsh. So both of these we would call ground gleaners. These categories make sense on a very, I think, intuitive level. Like, these birds are always on the ground. And then, you know, kind of intuit that they are part of this guild. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's it's really based on behavior and just what you see, right? You don't need to know necessarily the Latin name for these birds. Just by seeing its behavior, it, it, that can tell you a lot about the bird. All right, next location. So here's sort of an Atlanta-inspired one, the Beltline. So the Beltline, as you know, it's an urban trail, but this particular part has an open path, some shrubs and low plants on the sides, and then some taller trees beyond that. And You'll find these kinds of parks in a lot of different cities. Listeners might remember that we actually took a little field trip out to the Beltline last summer and we planted some native plants. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, Do you remember what you saw that day? What kind of birds were out? We were there for the chimney swifts because there were some towers. There are a couple of towers along the Beltline and we were planting some native plants so that they just have more buffet options. Yeah, absolutely chimney swifts, they're aerial insectivores. They're cruising through the air, screening for insects, and the plants that you all put in hopefully are going to, like, produce lots of insects that then these birds can eat. Okay, so who else might I find here at the belt line? You might see golden crown kinglets. They're tiny little spherical birds that are kind of going around the tops of trees and looking for insects in the foliage. So they're a foliage gleaner. Uh, There's also the orange crown warbler, another foliage and bark gleaner looking for insects. And the reason why I think the Beltline is a good place to look for them is that when you have like large trees and shrubs that you can see from the side, that's always a good place to look for warblers like this. If you're in like a big forest, it might be harder to actually find that bird because they can be in any tree in that whole forest and you might never see them. Okay, yeah, this is probably what happened when I went out with my mom. You know, I'll be honest and say that seeing very few birds was a little bit disappointing, but then I remembered that they, the birds, they have pretty good reason to be elusive. You know, predators are obviously a threat, especially during nesting season where they're like little fledgling babies. Yeah, I I think that's a very common experience, and I've actually had very similar birding experiences with my mom. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> Gotta work harder to impress them. <laughs> That's right. All right, on to location number three. 
a soccer field in like a residential neighborhood. What are some of the species you might see there, you think? Mm, my favorite game. Um, uh, I wonder if an area like this would be more likely to have like little squirrels or ground prey that might attract some of the bigger predatory birds. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're spot on. Oh, yeah. So red-tailed hawks, they're daytime predators, and a big thing they're looking for is a mammal called a vole. They're active during the day. Mice, in contrast, are nocturnal. So red-tailed hawks, yeah, absolutely. You're often going to see them soaring above a field like that, looking for voles, looking for songbirds on the ground that they can easily kind of swoop in and grab. Other species you might see at a ball field, northern flickers, This is a woodpecker that is actually a ground gleaner. Basically, they're using that woodpecker bill to drill into the ground and look for arthropods and invertebrates, just like woodpeckers and trees. All right, our last location, a pond at a park. Just go as straightforward as you can. Some, some duck friends, some geese. Absolutely. So there's kind of two big groups of ducks we talk about. There's the dabbling ducks and then the diving ducks. If you can still see the duck while it's eating, and usually you can see either the back or the feet are kind of swinging in the air, that's what the mallards do, that's a dabbling duck. If it totally vanishes from the surface, it's a diving duck. Ringneck ducks are a species that will actually go fully underwater and swim down to the bottom of the pond or hunt down a little aquatic insect in the water. It's kind of fun to see them disappear under the surface and then kind of wonder when they're going to come back up. You've also got piscivores, species that specialize in eating fish. So belted kingfishers are a great example of this. They will sort of fly above the surface of the water and then swoop down, grab a small fish, and fly back to their perch and eat it. These belted kingfishers, I have not seen one. I would love to see one. My husband is Australian and he's always like, okay, like our next trip, we'll go bird watching. And I am obsessed with the kookaburra. And I know the kookaburra is a kingfisher. And so I feel like, like if I was to see a belted kingfisher, I'd be real jazzed about it. They, they look like a kookaburra, a different coloring and obviously a different bird, but same family. Right. So I actually didn't know that. So kookaburras. <gasps> Did I teach you a thing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. The power. <laughs> well, I'm excited that maybe you're starting a kingfisher quest here. Yeah. Wrapping this up here, I think the takeaway I want to leave you with is like finding those frameworks for your knowledge that can help you like categorize birds so that it's not just like an endless list of random bird species. Like for me, that's not a lot of fun, you know okay, I've seen these 50 birds. Well, what does that mean? Like, what are their relationships with habitat and with their food resources? So if you can find something that works for you and helps you categorize why you see the birds in the places that you do, that can really, like, take your birding to the next level. Thank you so much, Connor. Thanks for having me on and keep me posted on your quest to see the kingfisher. I hope that in this season of Bring Birds Back, we can all be students and that we can approach each of these episodes excited to learn and to grow. Maybe you'll start challenging your assumptions about who a birder is and who they aren't. And along the way, you might find your community, your people, who make the journey all the more worthwhile. I'm thinking about that moment with my mom when we spotted that mockingbird. More than my keen sense of observation, I was proud that we were out and able to just be in that stillness. Because here we were, two girls from the concrete jungle, somewhere in a Georgia forest, looking at the brush and trying to catch birds in our binoculars, just waxing poetic about tree roots. And it was fantastic. You know what? I think you're a fledgling nature girl. That's what I think. I enjoy time in nature. I absolutely do. I just don't give it to myself a lot. But I'm in awe of it whenever I come out.
Spring Birds Pack is produced by Mark Bramhill and me, Tanaja Hamilton. Sam Johnson is our production assistant. We're edited by Oluwakemi Aladesui and Allison Berenger of Rough Cut Collective. Our fact checker is Connor Guerin. Our content director is Allison Wilson. Scoring is by Cosmo Sheldrake and Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Vicky Merrick, Rekha Murthy, and of course, my mama, 